Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. Before God, our lives were ruled by the gods. And in that time before the gods, mankind was alone through ages of darkness. But throughout all this cosmic turmoil, there has been one constant. Men and women in need of companionship have found comfort in the unique services provided by sex workers. You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. It's difficult to determine when our relationship with prostitution began, as the trade predates our written history. But what we do know is that wherever we find evidence of human culture, we find evidence of prostitution, hence its label as the oldest profession. That said, despite our significant history, society's treatment of the sex trade hasn't always been rose petals and red wine. It seems as though every government, religious movement, and ruling family has taken steps to regulate the industry, for better or worse. At present, the Government of Canada's legislation surrounding sex work is somewhat unique. It's legal to sell sex in Canada, but it's illegal to buy it which of course creates a complicated economy for sex workers to operate in. I suppose this odd method of regulation, in a way, mirrors the public opinion of Canadians, which is, and always has been, divided on the topic. Canada's most recent public opinion polls show that 45% of us support criminalizing prostitution, 45% of us oppose it, and the other 10% are left undecided. But at the end of the day, the country's opinion and policy simply creates the social obstacles sex workers and those who use their services need to skip past. Regardless of how any of us feel about it, the sex trade humps along. As you're listening to this episode of Nighttime, an attractive 20-something is receiving a text message from an out-of-town business person in response to an online ad for sexual services. As you sleep soundly in your bed tonight, an adventurous member of your community will sit naked in front of a webcam, playing out a fantasy in exchange for the financial donations of their viewers. And much like many of you out there, as far as I know, I haven't had anyone close to me work in the sex trade, and as such, I've always been stuck somewhere between ignorant and puzzled by questions like, who are these people, and why are they doing this? With nighttime aiming to uncover and highlight the stories that hide just out of sight in our cities, I thought these would be excellent questions to try to answer in an episode. Of course, every person, both sex workers and non-sex workers, have their own story and personal reasons for why they do what they do, but I can at least help share one person's story. Tonight, I'm proud to introduce you to Halifax's elite independent VIP escort, Miss Manda. Saw her for the first time on the afternoon of the 27th. In a word, unbelievable. She's better than advertised and all the reviews are true. Miss Manda's gorgeous, laid back, easy to talk to, and uh, very talented. Had a wonderful GFE with her and plan on becoming a regular whenever I'm in Halifax. Thanks, Manda. If you use the internet, you've probably come across the type of advertisements that form our guest Miss Manda's business model. These are the ads that usually feature a semi-nude girl, often with her face obscured or just out of frame. In the text of the ad, that often describes a variety of sexual services, an hourly rate, and end with an invitation to contact the girl in the photo for a good time. In a few short moments, we're going to meet one of the girls who appear in these ads, and hopefully you'll find it to be a good time. Now here's how it started. After a recent episode of Nighttime made several references to sex work, 
I wanted to tackle the topic directly, and that brought me to a Halifax-based VIP escort, Miss Manda. I told her I wanted to learn a bit more about the life of a high-class escort, and she agreed to meet for a coffee and a chat. As I made my way to the quiet coffee shop we planned to speak at, I had more than a few butterflies in my stomach. Somehow I was conditioned to expect a drugged-up criminal working under the control of a violent pimp. However, when I walked in and saw a well-dressed, attractive brunette staring in my direction, my anxieties were immediately gone. So let's get to it. In the upcoming piece, you'll hear Miss Manda and I talk about nearly every aspect of her work, except the sex part. I suppose if you want to know about that, that's between you and Miss Manda. Now, during some of this episode's musical breaks, you'll hear readings of actual reviews left by Miss Manda's clients. Being a happily married man, I can't comment on the services Miss Manda provides, but the reviews sound great. Take it from me, listeners. Hiring used to be hard. There were multiple job sites, near endless stacks of resumes, and a confusing review process. Fortunately, the dark ages of hiring are behind us. Today, in an age of magic and wonder, hiring can be easy. No longer will you need to accompany a mystic on a quest to interpret some ancient scribblings deep within Earth's darkest caverns. In fact, you only need to go to one place to get this done. ZipRecruiter dot com slash night. Here's how it works. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over a hundred of the web's leading job boards. Then, using their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans through thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and it invites them to apply for your job. But they don't stop there. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter's techniques are so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, nighttime listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash night. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash N-I-G-H-T. ZipRecruiter.com slash night. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Miss Mandy has an excellent personality body, skills, location, and overall experience. I'm a regular now. I started to see her for the porn star experience, but I've loved everything. Highly recommended. I've never left disappointed and have always left drained in more than one way. Tell me who you are and in brief what you do for your living. My name is Ms. Manda, and I do escorting and a little bit of camming and texting sex work. The terminology I've never understood. What is the difference between like an escort and like sex worker? Is there a difference? No. Anybody who offers sexual services is a sex worker. Um, strippers and some cam girls may disagree. Some porn stars I've even seen it debated on Twitter. Okay. Um, say they're not sex workers. Mm-hmm. They literally have sex for money. We're all sex workers. We sell literal sex mm-hmm. in its various forms. And what escort? What is that? Like, what does that even mean? I escort you on dates. Oh, okay. Yes. I, never, I never even thought so of that. So in places where the legality is very gray, mm-hmm. they can't sell sex at all. Um, they would sell their time and companionship. So they would be an escort for an afternoon. So okay. I don't know why I never put that together. (laughs) The term prostitute and prostitution, like to say someone's a prostitute, is that derogatory? It has been made that way. I don't find it so because to me it's the literal term for the word and I don't mind English. Mm. But some people find it very offensive because they see it as classist. So they see prostitutes are under escorts. Prostitute is literally the word for the person that sells sex. So yeah. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so kind of splitting hairs, but I, yeah. But I guess the more respectable way to say it would be a sex worker. Nowadays, yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So when the average person, like an outsider, views sex work and sex workers, it's often through the context of a girl uh, often controlled by like a pimp and maybe suffering with drug addiction and such. But sitting here with you, I can tell that you're a self-employed, intelligent, you know, a powerful girl who's making your own decisions. Could you tell me a little bit about some of the, the misconceptions people have about sex work? Yeah, people think that we all do drugs, we have pimps, um, we must have been molested as children. I wasn't. Um, we're all terrible dropouts. I know a friend was just here and she is Columbia educated. Mm. Most people I know aren't dropouts. Um, people do this for varying reasons. Mm. Um, but most people tend to think like who would ever do this like not my daughter well your daughter probably has sex you had sex that made a daughter why wouldn't she do this hmm. does she like it enough to do it full time <laughs> Interesting. so before we get into like your background and, and a bit of your history tell me a little bit about the structure of your business like how does how does this all operate um I post ads on the internet I maintain my online profiles and after years of being consistent with that I've built up a reputation for consistency and people kind of know where to find me. Like if you Google Halifax Escort, you definitely find me, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. And now I don't want to get too into it, mainly because I'm not mature enough to handle that type <laughs> no. of conversation, but what kind of services do you sell without getting you know too graphic? Like what do people come to you for? Um, companionship for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's looking for something a little different. There are people that come for what you'd expect. Most people come for... A different style of company. Um, each lady offers a different personality to spend time with, different offerings via services, mm -hmm. and some people like that kind of variety. Mm -hmm. And for the type of clients that you have, is there anything they would have in common? Like what type of people do you, do you encounter? Most of them are very sweet. Mm -hmm. um, usually looking for something a little different or have stumbled upon me online, which is increasingly happening, because I put myself on hashtags that I'm not asked to be on. <laughs> okay. Um, but they stumble upon me somehow, and I yeah. have found themselves intrigued, or they already partake in this industry, and they're like, ooh, I'd like something a little different. Yeah. But is it, like, is there one kind of certain type of guy that you would often see, or is it just a bit of everybody? Everybody. From, mm -hmm. like, students, like college students, to people's grandparents, like, everybody... Not every person does it, but every walk of person does it from every industry. It's kind of insane. Interesting. As far you, you mentioned, like it's all different types of people who are generally looking for different types of things, but a lot of companionship. What would be a typical date? Like without getting graphic, but just like what, what would be an average experience you'd have when you meet with someone? Um, they come in, we get acquainted. I'm very forward. I kind of like to set people off their game a little bit. So they come in and they're expecting, we'll get to know each other very nice like, and I'm kind of like, okay, we'll get to know each other, but let's get you naked and vulnerable first. <laughs> um, and then we'll chat while I'm sitting on your lap. So that's a okay. great introduction. It throws people, most people off. Unless yeah, I'm they're, blushing listening to it. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would work. So unless they're like well-versed in this, which a lot of people are, and they're used to it, and they're like, ooh, cool, you're comfortable. Yeah. Um, but you must get some nervous people that like first time or it's like what's that like yes um a little more chit chat at the beginning okay. just to make them more comfortable but can you tell pretty much right away sometimes i can sometimes i can't sometimes i'm really surprised because they just seem so comfortable but it's they had already kind of known what they were going to do today okay some people it's like the anticipation gives them a little bit of anxiety but not in a bad way just kind of you just sense it yeah yeah so you kind of have to calm them a little Hmm. And now, we, again, not to get specific, but give me an idea of like a positive experience. Can you think, like thinking back with your, your career, can you think of one of the best dates you've had? Yeah, probably. We went out for drinks to a few bars downtown. I don't really drink, but mm -hmm. sometimes sociables. Um, and we had black cocktails and we went for dinner and then we went back up to the hotel room. But it was more like about the companionship and mm -hmm. that was a really cool personality. And we meandered downtown before we went back, and then we went up, and then we had an overnight, so it was okay. very pleasant. So it's not always like the whole, you know, one hour no. rush thing. It can be, you know, a night, a night on the town. So somebody who encountered you would have had no idea what was going on. Yeah, I know. We were fairly similar in age. I, I dress appropriately, so if somebody's significantly older than me, we look like business companions more than anything. Okay. So nobody outside would ever have any idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
can you give me, if you're comfortable answering it, can you give me an idea of, of a date that didn't go well? Like what was a negative experience? Maybe one that changed the way you do this. One summer, two men, same issue. They asked to do something I don't offer, which was not on the table even before they came. They knew this, hmm. both of which had met me before. I expressed I did not offer them, handed them a toy. Here, let's do something else. Both of them threw the toy across the room. Oh. Who does that? Hmm. So I handed both of them back their money and they can all leave. Because um, you don't want any aggression and people get very upset about money. Like, I don't want your money. I just want you to go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was the only kind of aggression I've ever gotten was people throwing toys across my room because they couldn't put fingers somewhere I don't offer fingers. <laughs> I hate to laugh, but it's just It's It's, it's men throwing a temper tantrum. Yeah. Literally, I can't do this throwing my toys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it is a bad experience like that. Is that common or is it pretty, like for the most part? Twice in my whole career and they were both in one summer in 2014. Okay. And right. in hindsight, I was on, not on my A game. I should have screened them out. I knew better. The year of pricks, 2014. I got outed in 2014, okay. so I was so anxious that I couldn't trust my gut, trust my gut at that time. Okay. Um, I thought everybody was a threat, or sometimes I didn't think anybody was a threat. I just couldn't trust my screening. My screening is mostly based on impressions and judgment versus a background check. Understood. Um, well, at that time. So at, I was so all over the place that sometimes I saw people that I just shouldn't have seen because I was like, no, they're probably fine, and I'm just overthinking. Mm -hmm. I was not overthinking. On that point, something I wanted to ask about is, like, as far as your personal safety, what do you do to, you mentioned you go by your gut instinct, but how do you screen people to, to ensure that there's not a good chance of someone crazy running into you, but also I'm sure you must do some things as like kind of like a, a fail safe if something went wrong. Like, what are some things you do to protect yourself? Um, someone always knows where I am. Mm -hmm. So we have a call-in person. Um, when I'm, whenever I'm about to take a call, whether it's in call or out call, tell somebody where I'm going, when they should expect to hear from me again. Okay. If they don't, they contact me. If they don't then hear from me with another specified um, amount of time, then they'll either come to where they expect me to be or send the police, depending on how my vibe beforehand was. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. My friends are down, so they know what's <laughs> if up, they yeah. have to show up, then it might be for the best before the police get there. Yeah, okay. Maybe we just went over time. It's yeah. never happened that they've had to come. I always confirm on time. But you're, you're <laughs> yeah. But you're good to like check in, and that's kind of yep. how you do it. I'm thinking almost like a scuba diver when they're down low. They often will have like a, they'll have their hose that the air comes in, but they have another one that they can pull like every 15 seconds, or they'll pull that like three times if things are getting bad. Yep. So it's similar, except with your cell phone. Yep. So now before we get into talking about uh, more so about your life and your history. How, how does your work affect your, your personal relationships and your ability to have a romantic relationship? I'm just thinking, again, I'm, a, I'm new to this lifestyle, so I would be really uncomfortable if with, a, with, with a, a partner who is engaged in this lifestyle. It must make for some interesting conversations. It does. You really have to communicate openly and freely, mm -hmm. and it leads for some very uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. But if you guys want it to work, it has to be happening. Um, so you date very carefully. Yeah. You kind of vet them out and make sure that they're okay with it, and they're okay with it as much as they can be. Yeah. How do you <laughs> How do you approach that? Like, if you meet somebody not through your work, you know, you just meet at a coffee shop and you're hitting it off. You must have been in a position where you have to tell them what you do. I usually straight out tell them. <laughs> That's part of the package. Yeah. Okay. I like to. I like the shock value. Like I'm kind of a sadist, so yeah, I like. You're crazy. I like when people <laughs> are like, oh, because they weren't expecting that. Miss Manda is absolutely amazing. She has an outfit for every occasion. Although I'm the comfy pants and hoodie kind of guy, I suppose it provides easy access and takes me back to high school when everything was a quickie. Regardless, Miss Manda has somewhat converted me, and now I look forward to see what she has on. Given the work you do, one would be led to think that sex and sexuality is a big part of your life. Before you got involved in sex work, was, was sex you know, a, a big deal or a big part of your life? Uh, for me it was. I know for some girls it's a little different, mm -hmm. but for myself it definitely was. I was a little promiscuous. I like to meet different people. And I like a little variety. Over the time, it's turned into more of a business thing. But at the time when I got into this, I was like, well, I'm already promiscuous. The people I'm seeing, there was no screening process. You meet them through a friend or your social media and you chat for a while. Like, mm. how do you do it? So I did some research and 
posted my own ad and cut off everybody that I was seeing, by the way. Oh, really? Because okay. I was like, no more wasted time. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're in Halifax now talking, and you're known, I guess, to be working in Halifax and Atlanta, Canada? Somehow? Yeah, pretty much. We're, you don't have to say this town, but what kind of place are you from originally? Uh, southwestern Nova Scotia. Small town kind of Little place. Little tiny place, yeah. Uh, do, and do people from your past life, we'll call it, know what you do? Absolutely. They absolutely do. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned you were owed it. Yes. Uh, somebody from my hometown happened to find out what I do uh, around the same time that I decided I didn't want to sleep with them anymore. No oh, more wasted time. How convenient. And at that same time, I was refusing a gentleman in Newfoundland service, mm-hmm. but I was trying to dance around it because he seemed unstable. You don't tell some people no. Mm-hmm. Um, one person, the person from my hometown put me on the dirty.com. Uh, the person from Newfoundland found it. Both of them ran across the internet with my legal identity. Oh, shoot. Yeah. So that's actually still out there. Oh, wow. But it was probably the best, worst thing that ever could happen to me because it's very liberating. It was a terrible year. Yeah. But after that, like, what are you going to do? Tell my mom. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of pulling the band-aid off. Yeah. If you're going to do it as a career, people are going to find out. It's just... Pretty much. It's a shame that I guess that it wasn't on your terms, but... And you have to think about how big Canada is. Canada is the size of... Basically, we are the size we are, but we have both the population of the state of California. Mm -hmm. So it's bound that somebody's going to see you naked on the internet and know who you are. It's... Especially if you were promiscuous before. Yeah, yeah. How did, tell me about, you, you touched on it briefly there, but tell me about how you went from a promiscuous lifestyle to deciding to get involved in, in this. Like, well, it just seems like that's a big jump. Um, I wanted to for a long time. Didn't have the uh, gonads. <laughs> and I also had a roommate for a little bit. I lived on my own for a while and then I had a bad breakup. So I had roommates and that was very unsuitable for this. And then when I was finally getting rid of this one roommate, I was like, after this, I will see if I can do it. And as like two weeks later, after I got rid of the roommate, I started doing this. Wow. I moved out. I got a smaller apartment. It wasn't like to cover costs or anything. How did you, your first client where, where money was involved? Like, how did that happen? I responded to his ad on Craigslist for a lunchtime blowjob. So, oh, really? Yeah. Straight up. Wow. Yeah. And he was like, what's your rate? And I told him, and he was happy to do it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and, and were you, like at this point, were you thinking, I want to get involved in that for, as like to, to make money and, and you know, um, have a life? Or was it more about the sex and the adventure? It was part the adventure and part the money. Okay. I want to be paid for my adventure. I didn't want to keep having these adventures with what turn out half the time to be really shitty people mm. when I could do it more smartly. Mm. Now, you mentioned your family found out when you were out at back in 14. How do they react? What do they, what do they say about it? And what kind of things do they worry about? I'm assuming people worry. They worry about my safety. My mom's very modest about it. Mm. Uh, she doesn't really talk about it. She doesn't like to hear about it at all. But she's okay with it in the sense that she wants me to be safe and... Yeah. She's happy. I'm happy. Sometimes Mm -hmm. she sleeps at my other apartment. My dad, we didn't really talk about it until I got outed. Okay. And by then he kind of already knew I was making way too much money and these nails are a dead giveaway. (laughs) I was never the type. I'm a mechanic's daughter. Um, (laughs) So, but, but then I got outed and this person is from where I'm from and he was very rude and very public about ha ha ha. Like this is what I've done. So my dad was more proud, like, you will not do this to my daughter than he was angry at me for whatever I may have done to invoke this. Uh, so it was actually really good timing. I'm sorry, parents, I put you in that position. But uh, <laughs> it worked out really well. Everybody's very accepting of what I do. It hasn't changed anything. Mm-hmm. Is, like, do you see, maybe this isn't the right question, but people that are on the outside may perceive it as something to be ashamed of. And I know that it's a bit taboo, and maybe that's how society looks at it, but you seem to come across as not ashamed of what you're doing. <laughs> no, Do you not. think, is that common among, among girls in this profession? Among a lot of them, not as many can be as boisterous as I can, yeah. having been outed. Um, I don't really have anything to hide. Um, but most it's of like us are really... like you got a superpower really... from that. You're just like, oh, oh, yeah. yeah. It was the worst thing they ever could have done for me. I told my parents, <laughs> I was like, the next time it comes up in politics, you're going to see me on the news because I can speak. Yeah. Other ladies can't. They have to hide it from their families. It, they have to keep it from somebody. I don't have that bind. Interesting. Yeah. Hi. 
I have met Miss Nana on a few occasions now. She is a very beautiful woman who really enjoys what she does. Met her by herself as well as with a friend of hers. Twice. Wow! Is all I can say. So again, I'm an outsider and I don't know a lot about the legal environment that sex work occurs in, but I'm sure you pay attention to it. Yeah. So what, what's the current status? Like, what do you have to do to not run afoul of the law? So in Canada, mm-hmm. I'm totally different than the States, it had never been criminalized in Canada for us to sell and buy sex until 2014. And the Harper government thought that they would help us poor victimized women by uh, criminalizing our clients and making it illegal for making everybody criminals that deals with us and taking down our standard of clientele. But I can sell whatever I want, Mm -hmm. but nobody's allowed to buy it. So that makes our advertising a little bit tricky because whereas before sites like Backpage could host us, Mm -hmm. Backpage is down, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. Um, No site can host us if our website has sexual services on it, which we are legally allowed to sell. But if anybody hosts our website as a third party, they are... Uh, profiting, especially if we pay for those ads, uh, okay. from us and giving us a venue, which is technically pimping. Hmm. For me to give any sort of advice to ladies in a time where one of their main resources has gone down actually is illegal. That's coercion. Okay. So they want us to work single and alone. If anybody helps us at all, that's coercion. If we pay anybody and it's anything more than fair market value and 15% tip, um, it's considered exploitation. Wow. It's very serious. Yeah. But I guess... Given the way it's set up, you're kind of left alone to kind of fend for yourself yes. in your marketing and everything. Like, could you, could you, just as an example, if you hired a bodyguard, it, would that be? So well, I, was I guess do ma- this. most major companies probably would have a problem with that. Well, actually, I was going to do this. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth and have yeah. another company be like, actually, we would represent a hooker. <laughs> um, but I was going to go to the local whatever security companies and be like, so if I need security for an event or for my place or for a strip club party, I I need to hire someone at fair market value. Apparently, according to the laws, I should be able to go hire a common person to do Mm -hmm. what I need instead of hiring exploitative friends because apparently all of our friends that we would pay for something because they're the only people we can trust is exploitative. Mm -hmm. No security company is going to do that for us. They're not going to get their hands involved in something as political as that. Yeah. Nobody wants to do business with us, let alone host our ads or anything, Mm -hmm. because it's so criminalized. So they really cut us off at the ankles for that. It is like getting around, not I shouldn't say getting around the law, but is worrying about the legal ramifications of your work a big part of your life? Like, is it something you dedicate a lot of thought to? No. I know what the laws are, but I don't worry about it because anything I do that is in a legal gray area, I'm doing for the greater good of our common health and safety. Mm -hmm. Um, If I give a girl advice, Even if it was a sting and the cops trying to catch me up in a coercion thing, I did it because I want her to be safe. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to make money off of that. I don't charge for my advice. I just want anybody who chooses to partake in this to have the knowledge that I didn't have starting out, which could have kept me safe. My first four months, a lot of random things happened Mm -hmm. that don't happen anymore because I learned better. Some girls don't learn as quickly. If you can say, how old were you when you started? Uh, it was six years ago, so 23, okay. 29 this year. Okay. It, do you know a lot of, like, well, I should ask, have you ever had legal problems about this? No. Um, the stalker incident that I had in 2014 with the guy from Newfoundland, um, he made it sound like he was following me locally, so I called the police because I was actually concerned that neighbors were going to notice what was going on. I, he had me so outside myself. Oh. I was actually trolled really bad, and I fell for it, so now oh. I feel stupid. But I called the police because I was like, I'm being stalked. These people have my legal identity. They're outing my address. Like, I got doxxed. I was so scared for my safety. They told me to call cyberbullying. And what did I expect when I put my naked self on the internet? Oh. I'm also in their system from that since 2014. Have they ever come for me? No. No. And do you know a lot of other girls who've had trouble? Or is it rare? Like, because, again, as an outsider, the only time I really encounter news about sex work is like there was a bust and these three people were arrested or something like that. So it seems like it happens, like arrests happen often. They do. And those are in good faith. They're hoping to catch people exploiting the girls that are being pimped. And for that, nobody wants pimps. Like I don't want pimps. No girls in my standing want pimps. I don't think the girls that even have pimps want pimps, Mm -hmm. but they have limited resources compared to someone like me. Yeah. Um, could you just describe again, you work on your own, I guess self-employed is the way to put it. Independent. Not all girls are able to 
to achieve that or, or, or work in that environment? They don't think they can. Okay. Anybody that I've, I've, I have encountered that has had a pimp at the present time or previously has said that it's because they cover costs. They do their bookings for them. They do their online presence. They do their traveling. They do. They maintain their car. They provide childcare. They provide all of these things that this one person doesn't believe they're capable of on their own, as well as doing the escorting. Okay. It can be overwhelming. It's a lot. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just like running a small business. You have yeah. Your marketing, your accounting, all that stuff is happening. Yeah, especially once you've been doing it for a while, you can't just like keep winging it. You can, but it's hard. To make a name for yourself. I guess some people don't care about that. <laughs> yeah. It seems to me at least that the laws are put in place to kind of protect the, the vulnerable girl from yes. getting swept up with, you know, these bad people who are going to control her. But it seems like it's, for someone like you, it's kind of doing the opposite where it's forcing you onto this island. To me, because I was here when it was the wild, wild west in 2013 and 2012, mm. We could advertise freely. We could negotiate openly. Nothing had to be hidden. And there were no surprises when somebody arrived and didn't discuss what they were into. Because that's most aggression happens when somebody thinks they've paid for something they're not getting. Yeah. Um, I think the government, purposely, the Harper government, they tightened the old laws and made them stricter and kept us more isolated, kind of to prove a point. Mm -hmm. Here, girls, you want to do this. You can do this if you are indeed choosing to do this. But you will do it alone. And they want us to fail. And then when they fail, because we can only do it in very specific places, away from schools and certain neighborhoods, like we're expected to stay kind of in the shadows. Yeah. They want the monsters to get us. Like they want us mm. to fail. And then they can be like, look, we tried to help you vulnerable women and you just couldn't make it work. Mm. Actually, you made it hard for me to screen. Nobody, everybody's now a criminal. They don't want to give me the real name and phone number. Yeah. Serial killers won't give a name and phone number either. Mm. And I won't screen without one. You Nobody makes it through the door without a name and phone number because I need to know who I'm meeting, I don't want to end up dead hooker in a bathtub, like, yeah. it's insane. I had the pleasure of seeing Miss Manda today. All I can say is that she outdid herself and exceeded all of my expectations. Miss Manda is very beautiful, sensual, and mm, sophisticated. Manda and I had a fantastic meeting. I won't go into detail, but it was an appointment that had both of us laying beside each other afterwards, saying how great the experience was for us. Guys, she is a beauty queen and a real down-to-earth lady. I will definitely repeat, and I highly recommend. Thanks, Vanda. Until next time. So now for, for anyone who doesn't know someone involved in sex work or has never had the, the privilege to meet someone like you, why should they respect the profession? Everybody has sex. We all have sex. Everybody wants to have sex. Mm -hmm. why, is it, why is there such a stigma attached to sex? Like, why can't you have sexual relations with people and know what you want? Like, if you want a certain type of food or anything, and I'm not comparing us to fast food by any means, mm -hmm. but if, in this day and age, if you want something... And you can pay for it. You can have it if you are the appropriate kind of customer. Like, mm -hmm. if you don't wear shoes in certain stores, they will throw you out and they won't serve you. Mm -hmm. um, why is sex any different? People have needs. Mm -hmm. People need love and companionship and they need intimacy. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is married that comes to see us. Why are these people who travel 300 days a year denied any sort of affection because they don't want to maintain a relationship that makes the other person suffer for 300 days a year? Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many reasons why people come see us and so many types of people mm -hmm. that really you're criminalizing sex to criminalize sex work. Like, it's, it's very odd that it's so stigmatized. Yeah. They should respect us because everybody has sex. Mm -hmm. We're not doing anything out of the norm. We just enjoy it enough to share it with other people. And make a career out of it. Yeah, and we respect ourselves enough to charge a nice price. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we wrap it up, tell me a unique experience you had as a result of your career as a sex worker? What is some, like something you never imagined you'd find yourself into that this led to? Um, the lifestyle in general. Mm -hmm. I live on the commons, which I always wanted to do when I first got here. Never thought I'd be able to, working normal jobs. I live on the commons. I've got a beautiful view. Mm -hmm. I have everything I could ever want. Money doesn't buy happiness, but it allows me to provide for myself and my loved ones in mm -hmm. more ways than a job ever could. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's opened a lot of doors for me. It's given me time to become educated. Oh my goodness. Working a nine to five, you don't have time to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the greatest things that this has done for me is I dropped out of school due to social anxiety. And that really bothered me. And I was like, oh, am I stupid? Whatever. But I know I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'm a high school dropout that loves theoretical physics. There you go. And if it wasn't for sex work, I would have never had time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just because there's so much, a little extra time on my hands. I can put on a documentary while I'm doing my administrative work in my pajamas in my living room <laughs> on a Tuesday. Like, I don't have to go and do somebody else's dream. Yeah. Do you run into people off? Like when you go to the mall, when Miss Manda's walking through the mall, you must see sometimes random person. <laughs> What's you just nod and wink at them, or how does that work? If they notice, there's like this knowing glance. Yeah. If we notice, I'm pretty oblivious in public, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, in Halifax and in my neighborhood, it seems like people don't notice me as much. Mm -hmm. I kind of appreciate that. Either that, or they're just polite enough to not say anything. Okay. In PEI, people actually point and stare. <laughs> It's really interesting. I don't know if it's because I'm Ms. Mana or if it's because I'm the tattooed lady. Okay. It's very, very yeah, odd. Yeah, PEI is quite conservative. So I mean, People said that about Cape Breton too, but yeah. Cape Breton was so much more chill than PEI oh, is man. to me. PEI, they, I can feel it there. It's so weird. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I could talk about that but for yeah, Sometimes sure. I get recognized in public and yeah. most people are okay. Sometimes people scream out Ms. Manda from across the street and that's definitely not okay. Yeah. But you make a point to, like on social media and stuff, you don't show your face. No. It's so I can grocery shop and have some privacy. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> so before we finish up, anything you want to add, anything some that somebody has not had any experience talking to someone like you? would be surprised to hear. We're regular people. We have boyfriends and relationships and friendships and families like every other mm. sect of humanity. Mm. It's weird that when people think about sex work and sex workers, it's like, what must have happened to this poor person for them to want to do this? I enjoy sex. I was always that friend that people, other friends came to for advice. I was the one in junior high buying condoms for my friends because they can't be seen at the drugstore doing such things. Like, I don't care. Yeah. Why do we have this shame attached to sex? And just sex workers are regular people too. I don't know. That's the big thing. Perfect way to end it. Yeah. That was awesome. Thanks. I want to thank Miss Manda for making herself available for this episode and agreeing to give me a glimpse into the often misunderstood life of an escort. Miss Manda, I wish you nothing but health, happiness, and success in whichever career you choose. If that career is sex work, so long as everyone involved is consenting adults, I say go get them, girl. And that brings me to something else I want to address before we wrap this up, and that being the issue of human trafficking, sexual slavery, and any other type of exploitation. Those issues are beyond the scope of what I wanted to explore in this series. I went to Miss Manda more so to understand the life of an independent sex worker doing it on her own terms and doing it successfully. I realize not all sex workers enjoy the same freedoms, safety, and quality of life that Miss Manda does, and the causes of that are varied and complicated. If anyone wants my opinion, I think sex work's going to happen, and as such, the government should regulate it in such a way that protects those engaged in the profession and prevents the vulnerable from being exploited. How that'll happen, that's beyond me. But to all the sex working men and women out there, from me to you, stay safe. And with that, I'll conclude this episode of Nighttime. I want to give you a huge thank you to everyone who helped on this episode, starting out with the great group of guys who played the part of the Johns in Miss Manda's online reviews. Jonathan Torrens from Jonavision, Trailer Park Boys, and the always awesome Taggart and Torrens podcast, I'm completely honored to have you on the show. I started to see her for the porn star experience, but I've loved everything. Leroy, the lesser Luna from Dark Topic. Thanks, pal. She was generous with her time, and I found her to be a nice snuggler as well. Love you, Mandy. Your boy, Leroy. A huge thanks to Mike Boudet, the reigning king of true crime and the host of the critically acclaimed Sword and Scale. All I can say is she outdid herself and exceeded all my expectations. Thanks, Mandy. Until next time, smooch. Jeremy Collins, the super solid guy from the podcast we listen to podcast and Facebook group. Thank you, my friend. This is my Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. I'm gonna try that one. <laughs>
saw her for the first time on the afternoon of the 27th. One word. Unbelievable. Editing you guys made me laugh out loud on more than one occasion, but you all killed it. Next, I want to thank Fortnite Beats for providing the music for this episode. You can hear his incredible lo-fi hip-hop by clicking on the link in this episode's show notes or simply googling Fortnite Beats. Now, if you're interested in hearing more from Nighttime, please check out the Patreon group. It's a dollar a month and you can support the show as well as access the supporter exclusive feed, which provides ad-free early releases of episodes in addition to prior episodes no longer available on this main feed. You can join by visiting patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. I'd like to thank the current patrons of the show and welcome the newest members of the group. Zoe, the queen of system administration coops, Matt 15K Forn, Dave Molnar, and Spencer WW. I sincerely appreciate you supporting Nighttime and becoming patrons last month. For anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a hand by telling your friends about the show and leaving me a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you use. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities both on and off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or some feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, keep looking around and let me know when you see something weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.